coming on now? Because that was the big thing that that really struck out that stuck out for me when I read the articles was that we're we're exporting all this design and this technology for the tall buildings, but yet we're a country that has become so focused on our urban life, and we've actually I think shifted now. People more people are moving back to cities, right? And this is such a huge focus in our cities and towns, and yet we that doesn't seem to have made it over there. Is that just a lag? Is that just a natural progression? I, I think that's a very good observation. Yes, I think there okay. is. Um, we're now, I, I think it's fair to say, in a, in a kind of sec- second generation of the Chinese urbanization and boom. And the second generation has somewhat more promise. I mean, I think there's been a widespread realization that the first generation, while impressive in terms of its architectural achievement, um, you know, lacked certain things in terms of urban design. I mean, you have all these skyscrapers, you know, that are crazy, iconic buildings that have generated nicknames like, you know, the giant pants or the big shorts or the girl with the the girl with a thin waist or the bottle opener. Well, okay, great. But I mean, you know, those are you know, that's those are like pieces on a chessboard and they don't necessarily give you great cities, great texture like Paris or Chicago, New York, San Francisco, yeah. et cetera. So I think yes, the second generation is is um they're the Chinese are realizing that they need to do better, they need to think more holistically. Um, and in part, this is because the pollution is so bad. Yeah. I mean, um, it is absolutely horrific. We were there uh, on days when we, the John uh, Kim, the photographer and I who went, were th- there on days when Shanghai and Nanjing were struck by awful air pollution. Um, normally, it's really bad in Beijing, and this was unprecedented. In Nanjing, schools were shut for two days. You know, planes, plane flights had to be canceled. There was a run on face masks. Wow. I mean, it's, it, and if you think about, you know, living, I mean, we were only there for a couple of days. Uh, if you think about living in that day after day, you know, your kids can't go out and play. Uh, you face the pro, you know, you face the prospect of a shorter lifespan because of the polluted air you're breathing. I mean, this is serious this stuff. This is very but, serious. You know, yeah. And so, the the Chinese are are uh, obsessed with stability, mm-hmm. uh, and I think the leaders there realize that they have to get their act together and try to strike a balance between economic growth and the care of the environment because their growth has led to incredible environmental degradation, and I think that the people there you know, are really frustrated. Doesn't that speak, Blair, to their politics as well? And and this leads to a bigger question of what role politics and, um, and of course, what happens in nature, how that impacts architecture and design as well. And you wrote the book Terror and Wonder, Architecture in a Tumultuous Age, talking about this with 9-11 and Katrina and all of that. But in China, I mean, it's not about the individual. It's not about the person. It really is about what they produce. Right. It's it's a very different culture. I mean, American culture is really focused on the individual, uh, Chinese culture much more so on the family and society. Um, all architecture is political. I mean, <laughs> you know, yep. we, it is. And, yep. and, you know, I mean, Richard Daly, the former mayor of Chicago, who some considered, a, a, you know, a democratically elected dictator, once expressed <laughs> his admiration for, you know, for China. You know, they could build like, you know, six runways there while, you know, Daly, you know, took like, uh, you know, they could build six runways there in like a span of a year or two, whereas Daly, you know, had to go through seven years of uh, environmental uh, impact statements. You know, to build one runway at O'Hare. <laughs> so, you know, I think for da- from Daly's perspective, you know, China was like the ideal society because the rulers, you know, could just do everything they wanted uh, without, you know, d- checks and balances, <laughs> referenda. Come on, you got to be kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just steamroll everybody. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that the, you know, this is top down, very much top down urban planning, and it really, it, it, you know, it really reflects that. Now, the, so you've gotten bad examples of top-down urban planning. The flip side, of course, is that if the leadership you know, sees the light and decides to do good things, then good things can happen much more quickly. Yeah. Um, and certainly, you know, the Chinese are doing some things very well. I mean, they make us look like a third-world country when it comes to high-speed rail. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can get on a high-speed train in, in uh, China, and you're going... 200 miles an hour from, uh, you know, one city to another. So, um, for example, you know, there's a city near Beijing, Tianjin, which is 100 miles away. That sounds like a lot. But on a high-speed train, it's 35 minutes away. It's incredible. Zoom. 
Yeah, so they're thinking about something called cluster cities, where, you know, because of the high-speed rail networks, uh, areas of cities or clusters of cities can kind of share uh, infrastructure, airports, museums, other things. Well, you know, wh- why do you need to duplicate them if you're, uh, you know, so close because yeah. of high-speed trains? So this has, I, I think, you know, great um, potential, you know, not only for China, but for the cities of the Midwest. I mean, if you're in St. Louis, then, you know, uh, you know, you can, you know, you can get to Chicago much faster, Milwaukee, Detroit, Unfortunately, you know, our high-speed rail is sort of low-speed high-speed rail. Oh, boy, I mean, is uh, it ever. The American high-speed rail is going to be about 110 yeah. miles an hour at top speed, not 200. But, you know, it's still an improvement on uh, on what we have now. A number of years ago, I designed a headquarters um, here in Ann Arbor for a Japanese um, company, a missions company. And it was really interesting bringing um, contemporary design thought and then running into very, very powerful um, effects and influences of of ancient dictates of design and you you refer to that in some of these articles particularly on the housing i thought that was right. fascinating can you talk a little bit well, about th- how the old and the new have come together yeah i mean i think what you're what you may be referring to is the uh, system of placement of yes. buildings called feng shui correct and this is a, a an ancient um custom where uh, geomancers um, determine the the most opportune placement of buildings, and typically, what it means is that Chinese housing will often face south because that's deemed to be the uh, propitious, you know, the, the best way, and you know, to to face. And mm-hmm. it's not without practical reasons. I mean, houses uh, off that face south get more sunlight. Um, they may be open to breezes and things like that. So this made sense when you were building, um, you know, uh, one-story uh, courtyard houses yep. that lined up along these alleys called hutong in places like Beijing. But when you expand it to um, large-scale uh, high-rise apartment blocks that are 30 stories high and uh, making up new... Uh, developments that are housing as many as like 400,000 people, the population of Cleveland, it uh, it creates a kind of rigid um, uh, uh, planning approach that um, you know leads to these very monotonous yeah. um, uh, uh, complexes. I mean, there are other things. You know, it's not just it's not just the um, the feng shui that's kind of been twisted uh, in, in a bad way. It's also uh, rules that, um, you know, mandate that buildings have to be separate uh-huh. uh, from one another so they don't cast shadows on each other. And there's then there's just plain economics, which are that, you know, div- this is interesting, in China, uh, the government owns urban land. Uh, it leases urban it leases land urban, to yeah, developers. That, that was fascinating. Right. So, but in other words, you know, the leases are expensive. If I'm a developer and I, I just paid a lot of money for an expensive lease, then I've got to, you know, uh, build as many units to as high a density as possible and it, as with minimum cost. So for me, there's a great um, incentive not to vary the design of buildings, to make everything the same. Partly that's because I don't have to spend as much on architectural fees. Right. Uh, if everything is the same, I can just crank out the same cookie-cutter design. Also, many of the builders in China, uh, the, con- the, con- the construction workers, really lack, um, you know, yeah, sophisticated like skills. skills. Yeah. So I can just, you know, they can do the same thing over and over and over. It's easy. And that's all these things contribute to, um, you know, uh, to high-rise dwelling areas that really lack any kind of um, a vibrant public space. Because yeah, uh, it's just impossible them. to train people in the, in the trades at this, at this volume and at this growth, isn't right. it? It's it, just... It, it is... Well, it's, I wouldn't say it's impossible. I mean, um, but it's hard. It's and, very hard, yeah. Um, certainly, there are some very daring buildings in China, like uh, Rem Kulhas's, yep. uh, you know, China Central Television Tower. I mean, this is two leaning towers that are about 50 stories high that are connected by an L-shaped bridge at the top. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, this is the, the one that's been nicknamed the Big Shorts. 
yeah. and uh, it's very different from a conventional skyscraper. Kind of so they they are able to achieve, you know, with to carry out uh, very risk taking yeah. projects by engineers, but nonetheless, uh, for the the vast majority of the the buildings, um, you know, they're they're monolithic and and quite uh, monotonous. I mean, it, it, some people have said uh, that. Um, uh, what is it? Um, Tom Miller, who wrote a, book, a very good book called China's Urban Billion, said that Chinese cities were kind of like a, a Chinese feast where there were showy signature dishes. Those were like the iconic skyscrapers. And then there was the rice, you know, <laughs> the yeah. pervasive rice. <laughs> that was all over. And that's the housing box. It's yeah. just endless amounts of, of rice. And, and I, the, 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 um, the thing that also jumped out at me is that the Chicago architects and, and the other architects in this country, I'm assuming, are having to leave the housing alone, or they're walking away from these opportunities because it seems to be the one area where it's really difficult to create that influence and to bring the technology yeah. and to bring uh, contemporary thinking into it. Absolutely. I mean, um, one very good architect uh, from Chicago, Ralph Johnson, who's yep. won awards, national awards, for his um, high-rise housing in Chicago, was very frustrated with uh, a design in Tianjin, uh, the city near Beijing that I mentioned earlier, um, you know, he won an urban design award for his concept for a cluster of six or seven high rises. But then when it was built, it was gated. Uh, the central area, the park area in the middle of it was right. poorly designed. Many of the uh, towers were poorly constructed. So yeah, they, he walked away. Now this is, uh, this is sad really because, you know, the most pervasive uh, so, in, so instead of architects like Ralph Johnson designing housing, you've got Chinese firms that have very little creativity and really approach it as an engineering problem. You know, how many people can I fit into these boxes? And so, you know, the most pervasive type of high-rise has the least amount of creativity yeah. being uh, applied to it. That's that's a nightmare. Well, and the I thing mean, that, it, that, that, that you wrote that stopped me in my tracks was when you said, that well, I don't know if you said it, but it was maybe it was said to you that most of these buildings are really only built for for a twenty five year lifespan. Boy, yeah, and boy, right. when you think of what's going on, and then you put twenty five years on it, and we're accustomed to hundreds, even in our culture, right? Let alone get yeah. into Europe, that stops you in your tracks. Then, then you go, wow. I mean, that's still within yeah. within our generation, essentially, even for those of us now in our in our midlife, if you will. Yeah, it may be a good thing. Maybe I mean, you know, um, the the, uh, the maybe it's good that they'll have to rethink these in 25 <laughs> years. You know, and it'll just it'll be like a giant public works project. You know, that Chinese are really good at that. They just love to build stuff, yeah. and that you know that gives people jobs and uh, keeps the economy humming. Uh, so you know, yeah, it's like planned obsolescence, right? <laughs> um, uh, it, it's it's. It's not a yeah, but the quality of construction is often quite poor, and they've even come up with names uh, for shoddy construction. Uh, they call it tofu drag uh, <laughs> projects. <laughs> this is like uh, like the residue left over from making tofu, and so it's kind of like a, it means shoddy construction. And there was actually a uh, an infamous story of a of a building, a high rise in Shanghai that was fully built and then just fell over intact. Oh on its Lord. side yeah. a few years ago. Oh, um, I remember seeing something about know. that, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, these are the kind of legendary stories wow. that, that pop out of this uh, uh, country. Sometimes so, it's, yeah. not, it's not just forces of nature that do those things, <laughs> but the <laughs> no, actual construction. No, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's bad foresight on our part, mm. yeah, exactly. Very interesting series in the Chicago Tribune. Our guest is Blair Kamen, and he's a Pulitzer Prize Award winning author and we have really enjoyed our time with you today it occurred to me talking with you too when we talk about the impact design has on our lives sometimes design critics have quite an impact as well and i point to that six-part series you did on reinventing the lakefront of the uh, chicago shoreline uh, talking about the disparity between lakefront parks uh, and uh, the largely white and affluent areas on the north side of chicago and those that are bordered on the south side by uh, black and poor neighborhoods, and, and I guess that really forced uh, Chicago to think differently about how they design these things, and the, the mayor took a turn following your series. 
Um, well, thanks, Lucy. Uh, yeah, the, um, over a long time, the city really did come to grips with this disparity on the lakefront, and uh, it's take it's been 15 years, actually 16, since that series appeared. But if you go to the south side lakefront now, it's been dramatically um, rebuilt, and uh, you know that kind of separate but unequal um, uh, parkland that we had has has. Uh, has disappeared, mm. uh, uh, you know, but even, w I mean, you win one battle and then there are others to fight. I mean, Chicago uh, is still grappling with uh, having a great lakefront, par a great lakefront and great parks along its edge uh, of Lake Michigan, but uh, inland off the lakefront, the, the city really has a, a shortage of open space. So there's, you know, mm. and Mayor Emanuel, fortunately to his credit, is trying, has at least started to address that. So you know, there's always there's always something, but I guess if there wasn't always something, then architecture <laughs> critics wouldn't have anything to criticize. <laughs> so well, so the, that's a good thing. In, in wrapping up, I, I just I, I, it's been delightful. I've reread your book, and a journalist friend of mine gave it to me in 2011, and I've just reread it. And as I was saying to Lucien before the show, it was really wonderful to get uh, a reminder of some of the politics and all the things that we grappled with as a nation with 9/11, for instance. And I love yeah. reading about your writings about what's going on in Chicago with its super tolls and, um, and the effect that you had there on some of those designs, Trump's project in particular. Um, but the one that's, yeah. that's my curiosity um, is the Spire. Can you give us a yeah. one-minute update on the Spire as we wrap up here and what's going on with the Spire? Absolutely. So the Spire uh, is a proposed 2,000-foot uh, tower designed by Santiago Calatrava. Um, it is. Uh, it started construction in um, the boom years. It stopped in 2008, I believe, mm -hmm. um, when money ran out for the developer. Uh, now uh, the the developer, uh, an Irish guy, Garrett Kelleher, went into bankruptcy. Um, he owed architects and engineers tons of money. Oh, um, this week, this very week, uh, a settlement was reached where. Um, uh, a north, uh, a suburban Chicago company uh, that builds apartment buildings has agreed to bail Kelleher out of bankruptcy, take care of his debts, and they are going to try to build, they say, they are going to try to build the spire. Now, it's one thing to get the guy out of bankruptcy. It's another thing to pre-sell enough condominiums yeah. that banks will loan you money for construction. So, uh, I mean, there's a glimmer of hope for this thing. Okay. Honestly, I wouldn't bet the farm that it's going to happen. <laughs> mm. Well, and, and we both, I, I, sh I share your uh, enthusiasm for Millennium Park. I just think it's a, it's a, uh, a master stroke. I love Millennium Park. Um, yeah, I love it's coming over there. It's just yeah. brilliant. Um, yeah, I, I think it's really, uh, really shown that, you know, cities can be focal points for people of different you know races and classes yeah. to come together even in the digital age it's been incredibly successful and um you know i'm i'm fascinated by detroit i mean you know uh yeah. the you know detroit is shrinking 